Welcome back everyone, Mr. Philip Campbell here. This video lecture is meant to go along with week six in my honors course uh, for the class Modern American History 1865 to 2000. And in this lecture I want to talk about the presidential election of 1928. Now, coming out of the 20s, the president was Calvin Coolidge, but he had decided not to run for re-election. So in 1928, the race was between Coolidge's Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, and the governor of New York, Al Smith. Both Hoover and Al Smith were, uh, were competent men. They were had, had the reputation of being notable and experienced leaders. So it seemed to be a fairly even matchup. Now, this election of 1928 is notable because Al Smith was the first Catholic presidential candidate in the history of the United States. Now, this caused him considerable suffering due to anti-Catholic prejudice. Um, there was common beliefs that if he were to win the presidential election, that... Um, that American liberties would be endangered by having a Catholic in office. And some of these fears were very, very crass and crude, like the idea that the, the Pope would move to Washington, D.C. and rule from a fortress in Washington where he would give orders to Smith about how to, uh, how to run the nation, or that the Catholic Church would bring the Inquisition to the U United States in order to crush Protestantism. And these weren't just uh, fears that were confined to the unwashed, uh, uneducated masses. Um, uh, senator Thomas Heflin, the senator from Alabama, on the floor of the Senate gave a speech denouncing the candidacy of Al Smith, saying, quote, the Catholic state will crush the life out of Pro Protestantism in America. So there's this widespread paranoia about uh, what a Catholic president would mean. But more widespread was concern about the allegiance of, of Catholics. Not everybody believed that the Pope was going to move to Washington and absurd things like that. But there was amongst the Protestant elites and intellectuals of the day this, uh, this concern about the loyalty of Catholics. And this is exemplified by a letter written by prominent attorney Charles Marshall that was published in the Atlantic Monthly in April 1927. And Marshall argued that Catholics suffer from a divided loyalty. He said that there exists, quote, a quandary for that man who is at once a loyal churchman and a loyal citizen, end quote. To get at the heart of what this quandary was that Marshall spoke of, we could look at another letter, a manifesto uh, authored by Dr. Clarence Tappert, who was the head of the National Lutheran Editors and Managers Association. And he wrote a manifesto protesting Smith's fitness to serve based on, quote, the peculiar relation in which a faithful Catholic stands and the absolute allegiance he owes to a foreign sovereign, end quote. There was this idea that because Catholics have an allegiance to the Pope, who is a foreign sovereign, that is the Pope is the head of, uh, of, of, Vatican, of uh, the Vatican State, technically he's a foreign head of government, that Catholics can't be loyal American citizens and loyal Catholics, especially <clears throat> if the teachings of the Pope or the Catholic Church contradict American values. Um, uh, how, can, how can you have absolute allegiance to the church and to a foreign leader while simultaneously having absolute allegiance to the United States if those two come into conflict? So Catholics always were viewed as sort of constituting a potential fifth column uh, within the United States body politic. That is, they were always of suspected loyalty, potentially treasonous because of their allegiance to the Pope. There was also a lot of wild rumor going around, like there was this rumor that the fourth degree Knights of Columbus had all taken an oath swearing to kill Protestants on the order of the, uh, the Pope. But beyond all this uh, paranoia, all the, uh, the anti-Catholic prejudice and whatnot, there was just this general sense in American society uh, among mainstream Protestantism that the Catholic Church was essentially un-American, that it represented part of an alien culture that was hostile to freedom and fundamentally anti-democratic. 
Now, Smith had other weaknesses as well. I don't mean to suggest his only weakness as a candidate was his Catholicism. He was opposed to prohibition. He's a, a good Catholic, so he was, he was opposed to prohibition. And surprisingly, prohibition was very popular among, uh, amongst Protestants in this country. Prohibition had been enacted largely due to the temperance movement, which was driven by uh, Protestant evangelicals. So this hurt, hurt Smith <clears throat> among Protestants, especially in rural areas. Also, as governor of New York, he had been tainted with the corruption of Tammany Hall. And Tammany Hall was the, uh, the name for the democratic political machine that controlled New York City. It was notoriously corrupt. And because Smith was from New York, he, he obviously suffered from that um, association. Smith lost the election in 1928 epically. Um, the electoral vote was 444 for Hoover, 87 for Smith. He lost all but just a handful of states. And very notably, he lost several states in the, in the South that had gone Democratic since Reconstruction. Although he did have... Uh, he did have the modest support in New England among Italian immigrants and Irish immigrants. Um, but it was a pretty epic defeat, and no major party would try to field a Catholic candidate again for president until 1960 with John F. Kennedy, who was and remains to this day our nation's only Catholic president. And by by 1960, much of this anti-Catholic prejudice had dissipated, although even Kennedy would face the same sort of questions about his allegiance as uh, Smith did. But that's a lecture for another day. So now you know about the, uh, the fascinating 1928 election between Al Smith and Herbert Hoover and how America's oldest prejudice, anti-Catholicism, uh, played into it. I also want to say a word briefly about the farm crisis of the 1920s. When we think of the Great Depression or the beginning of the Depression, our thoughts inevitably turn to the stock market crash of 1929. But the first signs of economic downturn actually began a lot earlier on American farms, in fact, as early as 1920 or 1921. And throughout the 1920s, there was a farm crisis in rural America that grew progressively worse and really constituted the first signs of the economic downturn that would become the Great Depression. So the origins of this farm crisis, during World War I, there was a record demand for American agricultural goods to, uh, to support and feed the war effort of, uh, of World War I. And the United States government encouraged this. They pursued inflationary policies. They encouraged more yields from farmers. There was a, there was a, a propaganda campaign amongst American farmers to put more land under, um, uh, under tillage to, uh, to up their yields for the war effort. And because demand was high, farmers were paid well. So there was a great expansion of farming during the, uh, the years of World War I. And farmers were paid very well for this because demand was high amongst the Americans and the allies for American agricultural goods. So the result of this is that a lot more land was put under tillage. Um, and a lot of loans were, were taken out. Mortgages were taken out to, um, to make capital improvements in farms. A lot of loans were taken out for mechanization because in the second decade of the 20th century, this is when we really transfer from the old animal-driven farms, oxen and, and uh, cattle and things like that, into, uh, into tractors and, uh, and uh, mechanized instruments. Now, these things aren't cheap. And farmers often had to take out loans for them uh, against which they pledged their land or their assets as collateral. Or if they wanted to put more land under tillage um, because the economy was so good for farmers, they often um, took out uh, additional mortgages to buy more lands or, or things like that. So um, there was, it was a good time for farmers during World War I, but it came at the expense of a lot of, uh, a lot of debt. Now, after the war, however, demand uh, started to drop, obviously. It started to go back to pre-war levels, and the prices for agricultural goods began to fall. Uh, beginning in 1920 and then going steadily throughout the 20s, the price of, of crops began to fall. But the farmers had, had, they had mortgages to pay. They'd, uh, they'd gotten used to They'd gotten used to the high prices of the war years, but more importantly, they had they had debt. Um, 
two fifths of uh, two fifths of all American farmers were in in uh, serious debt, and uh, a lot of this debt had been taken out um, out of patriotic sentiment to uh, to uh, help the war effort to mechanize their uh, their farms. Um, and they'd been taken out at levels when the economy was good. And now that the economy was starting to falter in the agricultural sector, they couldn't pay them back. How did they deal with this? The farmers um, tried to deal with the lower demand by producing more, by farming even more intensively, in hopes that they could make up in quantity what they were losing in, uh, in selling price. So if the price of corn was going down, they would try to produce more corn to, uh, to sell it in order to make up that difference. Now, that was self-defeating because that just flooded the market with more surplus, which in turn drove the prices down further, which in turn uh, uh, hurt the farmers even more. Land values began to plummet, and many farmers finally could not pay back their loans. Now, the terms of many of these loans, they, they pledged their land or its assets as collateral. And the banks began to foreclose on these farms, and many farmers were literally thrown off their land, and the farms became bank-owned. Uh, this crisis got very severe during the mid-1920s. During this decade, uh, about one-third of every American farmer lost his farm. So it was a very, very serious crisis. And this, in turn, caused many small... Uh, country banks to close because these small country banks often depended on farm deposits to stay solvent. And when the farms started going under, the country banks started going under, which in turn created a credit crunch uh, in the rural areas. It made less credit available to farmers and anyone who lived in agricultural areas, which hurt the economy in general. So it started to creep uh, out of the farming sector into banking. Herbert Hoover um, tried to, to fix this. He, he formed a government organization to offer government loans to farmers. He tried to fund a scheme to buy up the surpluses, but uh, it, it wasn't uh, the, the, the intervention of Hoover came to nothing because it was too, just too small scale. It would fall to Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, and his New Deal to really address this in depth. FDR uh, pushed through something called the Agricultural Adjustment Act, this was a very sweeping revolutionary um, government act which uh, essentially paid farmers not to farm. It tried to attack the root cause of the crisis. The cause was a surplus that was driving uh, agricultural values down. So the Agricultural Adjustment Act paid farmers a... Um, paid them a subsidy essentially to not farm, to keep their goods off the market. And of course, this is the beginning of, uh, I mean, even to this day, farmers get, uh, get subsidies from the United States government. Um, the AAA also provided mortgage relief and even allowed uh, farmers in some circumstances to get their farms back after they'd been foreclosed on even by the bank. Now, um, in 1935, however, the Agricultural Adjustment Act was found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, um, and so things, uh, all, all of Roosevelt's plans couldn't uh, come to fruition regarding agriculture. It wasn't until 1940 that farm foreclosures finally dropped off, but it was a huge readjustment. And um, if we look back in American history, the 20s really is the, the time when we shift our economy from from the agricultural economy that we'd known for centuries into the more urbanized industrial economy. For example, in 1920, 27% of the population was engaged in farming. Um, not a lot, uh, well, not a majority, still a lot though, a third of Americans engaged in agriculture, that's a lot. Uh, over the course of the next 90 years, um, after the 1920s, by the, the census of 2010, only 2% 2 of the population is, was uh, engaged in farming. So, um, so the 1920s, if we're really looking for that period that marked the end of the universality of the, the small family farm, uh, it, was, it was the 1920s and the farm crisis that preceded the Great Depression 